Okay, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. If you are just joining or transitioning from the previous session, uh, this is the session uh, for CIHR for uh, launching the HIV and STBBI Research Initiative Strategic Plan. Uh, so welcome and uh, just waiting for people to uh, complete their transition from the previous. Again, thanks so much for joining us and we'll be starting in about 10, 15 seconds. <clears throat> okay, we have about uh, 75 people uh, already joined us, so we let other people transition in and for the sake of time, I'm going to get started. So good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Charu Kaushik. Uh, and I'm the scientific director of the CIHR Institute of Infection and Immunity. And if you're just joining us, this is the session where CIHR is releasing, is launching its uh, HIV, AIDS and STBBI research initiative strategic plan. It's a mouthful, but um, hopefully by the end of the hour, you will have a pretty good idea of what we are talking about. Uh, so uh, I will start out first by acknowledging that I'm joining you today from McMaster University, uh, which uh, and uh, would like to start out by honoring and thanking uh, the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe nations as the traditional inhabitants of the land where McMaster sta stands. Uh, to say that is to acknowledge a debt to those who were here before us and to recognize our responsibilities as guests and settlers to respect and honor the intimate relationship of the indigenous people have to this land. Uh, and acknowledging the virtual nature of this meeting, I would also like to pay respect to all First Nation, Inuit and Métis people from coast to coast to coast and for their past and ongoing contributions to our society. As many of you are joining us across Canada, I encourage you to pause for a moment to acknowledge the lands where you are currently living and working. Thank you, Megovich. So uh, it gives me great pleasure to uh, welcome everyone uh, and uh, you know, to acknowledge that it's a full circle. Three years ago in 2019, prior to the pandemic, we had started this process of engaging the community uh, to launch the um, next five-year plan for the HIV uh, STBBI federal initiative. And here we are, a pandemic, and three years later, releasing at CAR, uh, where we started first. So uh, I'd like to thank, uh, in this past three years, the continuous engagement of the SHAZRAC, the advisory body uh, that advises uh, CIHR uh, on the strategic priorities for uh, HIV STBBI investments. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, CIHR staff, especially the IMIS staff that work closely with the Institute staff, uh, my own IIII team who, who have worked closely with the CIHR central team, but also the leadership of CIHR who has been very supportive of uh, us putting together this uh, engagement and plan during very testing times. Uh, and everyone in the HIV, AIDS, and STBBI research community, many of who are here today for the engagement throughout this process. Um, uh, again, many of you will remember that in 2019 in Saskatchewan, the team and I were there to start our engagement uh, on what the shape or how should we shape the next five-year uh, research strategic investment plan uh, and here we are, uh, three years later, uh, launching it at CAR again. Uh, so uh, to start this, uh, so today we will have uh, some remarks from CIHR President Dr. Michael Strong, followed by Dr. Keith Folk, who is the chair of the uh, HIV, CIHR HIV AIDS and STBBI Research Advisory Committee, or SHAZRAC for small, for a short. Uh, and they will both provide some opening remarks and context. 
Uh, and then the remainder of the program uh, will feature, uh, first, I will take a brief 10 minutes to give you an overview and invite you to visit the CIHR website uh, to look at the plan in more detail. Uh, and then the final part, the last half hour, we will have an exciting panel discussion from leaders from within our research community who will share their expertise on a theme that comes very loud and clear through the entire engagement program and is now a big feature that you will see. Uh, it's an integral part of the new strategic plan promoting healthcare or uh, health equity across the cascade of care. So we'll have a good discussion on that and Dr. Angela Kaida will be uh, moderating that. So I invite you to stay for the whole hour. Uh, and then just for some housekeeping comments, uh, feel free to share your comments and questions in the chat box. Uh, we will try our best. It is a tight timeline, but we'll try our best to at least reply in writing, uh, or we can come back to you later uh, in terms of providing some questions if you have specifically on the remarks uh, that Dr. Strong or uh, my uh, previewing or uh, inaugurating the uh, strategic plan. Uh, the event today will be in English, but feel free to ask your uh, questions in French or English. We have a staff who are fluent in both. Uh, and this event will be recorded and shared uh, at a later date. So uh, without further ado, my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Michael Strong, the president of CIHR. Uh, uh, and Mike, I'll start by thanking you for your support and endorsement of uh, where we have landed with this plan and over to you uh, for some opening remarks. Hey, thank, thank you very much, uh, Drew. So bonjour a tous. Uh, merci de voir uh, invite me gendre à vous aujourd'hui. Uh, hello, everyone, and, and thank you for inviting me to join you today. Today, I'm, I'm very pleased to provide opening remarks to introduce the new CIHR HIV, AIDS, and Sexually Transmitted and Bloodborne uh, Infections Research Initiative Strategic Plan, which will guide the activities of the research initiative over the next five years. This plan reaffirms our commitment to investing in research to address the pandemics of HIV, AIDS, and STBBI. Now, as you know, uh, or may know, in February of 2021, CIHR published its overall strategic plan for 2021 through to 2031, a vision for a healthier future, which reflects our organization's vision and priorities uh, for the next 10 years. The CIHR HIV, AIDS, and STBBI Research Initiative Strategic Plan uh, that we are launching today links with the overall CIHR strategic plan uh, in several ways. Both plans emphasize the importance of advancing research excellence and strengthening health research capacity. Both plans also commit to improve health equity with the STBBI plan focusing on the vulnerable populations in our society, including African, Caribbean and black communities. And also rights seeking First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. The plan also recognizes that an intersectional lens is required to understand the true impacts of HIV AIDS and STBBI on individuals and communities. Furthermore, both plans support knowledge mobilization so that research findings can inform policies and practices. The CIHR, HIV, AIDS, and STBBI Research Initiative Strategic Plan also reflects broader Government of Canada commitments to the global goal of ending AIDS and other sexually transmitted diseases and bloodborne infections as public health concerns by 2030. We know that COVID-19 has made things especially challenging. The Government of Canada recognizes the compounded health and social impacts COVID-19 has had on key populations affected by HIV and other STBI. We are continuing to work with partners uh, to better understand and address these challenges. In the last year, CIHR has dedicated approximately three and a half million dollars to fund research projects addressing the effects of COVID on the outcomes and care of people living with HIV AIDS and STBBI. The new CIHR HIV AIDS and STBBI Research Initiative Strategic Plan reaffirms our commitment to working with the HIV AIDS and STBBI community and to collaborate to fund research and support researchers in addressing health needs from improving testing to tackling stigma. I invite you to read the HIV, AIDS, and STBBI Research Initiative Strategic Plan to learn more about our vision, objectives, and plans. Finally, I do want to say thank you to the members of our CIHR 
HIV AIDS and STBVI research advisory community, Shazrak, uh, to our diverse research community, national and international partners, community members and those with living or lived experience for sharing your insights and perspectives. Your input has helped make the plan relevant and in tune with current realities. I look forward to hearing about the progress we're making to limit HIV, AIDS and other STBI in Canada and well beyond. So thank you very, very much for this opportunity. Back to you, Chair. Uh, thank you so much, Mike. Appreciate your uh, comments and support. And thank you again for finding time to stay with us, uh, which I didn't realize you were gonna be able to spare a whole hour. So thank you so much. Hopefully you'll enjoy the panel discussion as well. Uh, so uh, next I will invite uh, Dr. Keith Folk, who is no stranger to this community. To provide some remarks, uh, Dr. Folk uh, is a good colleague, uh, collaborator, and also happens to be the, the chair of the uh, Shazrak uh, committee. And it's under his leadership that the uh, Shazrak has provided uh, advice, guidance, um, and feedback on this plan. Uh, and uh, I'll acknowledge the individual members as I go through the plan itself, but I would invite uh, Keith, who is also professor and department chair at the University of Manitoba Department of Medical Microbiology and the current president of CAR to actually provide some uh, overarching remarks uh, on the process and where we've landed with this plan. So Keith, over to you. Great, thanks very much, Cheru. Um, good morning, everyone, uh, good afternoon, and. Thanks for, um, uh, for joining us today for this very important announcement. Um, the, uh, I'd like to first of all thank uh, CHR and the III for choosing to make this announcement at the CAR conference. I think it recognizes that um, CAR is one of the important members of the scientific community um, that, uh, um, that is affected and drives this initiative. Um, so uh, appreciate your partnership in, in this. Uh, the Shazrak Committee is a diverse committee that represents uh, researchers from HIV and other STBBI research fields from across Canada, um, including all disciplines. And it also has community members, including those with lived experience. And uh, so I think the, the Shazrak uh, Committee has been um, a good sounding board for uh, CHR and the III for developing this plan. The, um, the committee was consulted over 12 times from uh, over four years from the concept of developing the um, strategic plan to how it was going to happen um, and then several times in, in terms of specific feedback and all through that um, we could uh, see that the feedback that we were giving was being incorporated. Um, so I think it's a, a very strong plan. I look forward to um, hearing others comments on it and I'd like to thank the Shazrak uh, committee members for their thoughtful in input um, on uh, on this uh, strategic plan because I think it does it has helped make the plan much more effective and uh, be a, a strong tool that we'll use for going forward to fight HIV and other STBBIs in the future for Canada. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Keith. So. Um... Uh, aware of the time, want to give most of the time available to the panelists uh, for this and again inviting the community to join us uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, visit the CHR website. The plan will be posted, uh, I believe, right after this uh, session is over. Uh, so um, uh, I'll take about 10, 15 minutes just to kind of give you an overview and then invite you to uh, review it more carefully at the website. Uh, so uh, thanks, Nadia. Let's just jump to the next slide. Uh, so uh, just to give a little bit of context, the HIV AIDS and the STBBI Research Initiative, which I'll just say our research initiative for short, it's a mouthful. I'll probably save a few seconds if I just say the research initiative. So the research initiative aligns with the Government of Canada's commitment to the global goal of ending HIV, AIDS, and STBBIs as a public health concern by 2030. Uh, this was outlined in the 2018 Pan-Canadian STBBI framework and the 2019 action plan on STBBI that was released by the minister, uh, uh, minister in, I'm trying to remember, 2019 July. 
the federal initiative funding is has been repurposed because it was originally HIV AIDS and is now aligned with this pan-Canadian STBBI framework. So from a researcher perspective, you would have noticed that in the last few uh, funding initiatives, uh, the uh, applications and the research scope is open, not just to HIV, but also to STBBIs. Uh, as a part of our responsibility for from the CIHR side, uh, this includes uh, developing a strategic plan for extramural HIV and STBBI research. Uh, supporting research in priority areas, including four research funding streams, which regardless of where the priorities land, these are the four area, areas that CIHR has committed to fund. Uh, the biomedical and clinical, health services and population health, community-based research, and CIHR Canadian HIV Trials Network, which many of you are familiar with. Uh, and finally, to maintaining a, a CIHR uh, HIV AIDS and STBBI Research Advisory Committee or SHAZRAC for short, whose mandate includes providing advice to CIHR on these research initiatives and advising the research uh, initiative strategic plan, uh, which is why as Keith outlined, we worked very closely for past three years in shaping this plan with the SHAZRAC committee. Next slide, please. So the, uh, I just want to spend one slide on the process. Uh, like I said, you know, we launched the process of engagement with the community in 2019 April at the uh, at the car meeting in uh, in uh, Saskatchewan. Uh, and little did we know, the goal was to actually complete the process in a year and announce, uh, you know, the uh, plan at the end of the next year. But of course, uh, a global pandemic intervened, so we actually had to pause between uh, the initial online and workshops and the, um, the process of actually integrating all that information. So the online survey, which was launched, uh, I think in September of 2019, if I rec recollect correctly, uh, uh, included 72 participants. If you go on the website, you can actually see the exact uh, details of who responded and who was included in these workshops and focus groups. Uh, and the online survey. Uh, it was a mix of early uh, career, mid-career, and senior researchers from all different pillars uh, within the HIV STBBI community. Uh, this was followed by our engagement between July 2019 to uh, November, December of 2019, where there were four events where we, the team and I went out at uh, the CAR meeting, can Hepsi meeting, the SDI and HIV World Congress, uh, and then the October CTN meeting. Uh, and then this was followed by nine focus groups that we had virtually, uh, which included about 60 participants. And we tried to cover uh, specific focus uh, areas, uh, including different pillars, STBBI uh, researchers. Uh, multiple times we have gone to SHAFRAC, public health and knowledge users, as well as focused con, uh, engagement of indigenous researchers and organizations. Uh, I also want to flag that at every step of the way, we have had uh, lengthy discussions and included input from people with lived and living experience who have participated in the survey focus groups uh, are themselves represented in SHAZRAC. And then finally, in the final steps of this, uh, SHAZRAC advised that we form a small committee of uh, uh, community members, uh, some of whom have lived and living experience, to uh, look at the final versions of these. So we have gone through an extensive process of trying to get this right. So hopefully that will resonate with everyone. Next slide. <clears throat> so the overall strategy uh, is outlined here. The vision is research excellence that reduces the incidence and improves the management of HIV and STBBIs. Uh, eliminate stigma and discrimination and has a transformative and equitable impact on the lives of people living with and at risk of acquiring HIV and STBBI. I just want to flag because this has been brought up a few times that why are we uh, separating HIV and STBBI and I just want to clarify that there's no um, you know, specific intent here because this research initiative was known as the HIV research initiative. 
and it has now transitioned to uh, STBBI initiative. We wanted to make sure that we were inclusive and not, there's no indication here of excluding any particular community. So that's why we are choosing to highlight that this continues to be an HIV AIDS initiative, but is also including other STBBIs. So just wanna clarify that because this has come up a few different times. The mission then to ac accomplish this vision is to strengthen and support a diverse, inclusive and collaborative research community that applies community-based holistic and inter and transdisciplinary approaches to create and mobilize prevention, testing, treatment and care of HIV, AIDS and STBBI in Canada and around the world. So I invite you to uh, every word that the, I have said has taken a lot of time to get it right. So I invite you to take some time to read through this uh, to see whether you can identify and uh, see yourself uh, in, in this plan. So on the right, you can see the strategic goal. There are four strategic goals, uh, accelerate discovery and innovation, improve health equity, strengthen research capacity and mobilize knowledge. I will get into a little bit more detail of this. Uh, and then there are five cross-cutting principles, including inclusive research excellence, uh, engagement of people with lived and living experience, health equity, truth and reconciliation, and holistic concept of health. These are uh, cross-cutting principles because we heard this over and over in every engagement that we had with our community. So these are uh, principles that will apply regardless of where the funding initiatives will come out in the four different strategic goals. Next slide. <clears throat> so uh, uh, just the four different uh, strategic goals. I wanna get into a little bit more detail without taking too much time. So the improve health equity uh, strategic goal really involves uh, achieving or improving health equity through research that addresses systemic, biomedical, behavioral and social determinants of health in order to reduce the high burden of HIV AIDS and STBBI in key populations. Uh, and then I'm going to, not going to read through the whole things, but really the directions within this strategic goal include focus on determinants of health, which include uh, advancing research and interventions to understand, address, and reduce impact of stigma, racism, homophobia, transphobia, sexism, and other forms of discrimination and system, systematically or systemically entrenched oppression of people living with and at risk of HIV, AIDS, and STBBI. Uh, developing new models of care. So research that focuses on developing, testing, and advancing new and improved culturally safe and holistic models of care. And ev evidence-based interventions, again, for an equitable health outcome. Uh, and then a focus on sexual and reproductive health. Uh, you know, so we heard, that instead of treating uh, STBBIs and uh, HIV, uh, primarily through a lens of disease, uh, let's focus on, on building better sexual and reproductive health and resilience in, in our communities. Uh, so that's the uh, final, the third focus uh, within this uh, goal with a five-year vision to reduce health inequity due to upstream factors. Next slide. Uh, the second focus uh, of the, or, or the second goal uh, within the strategic plan is accelerate discovery and innovation. We recognize that uh, the uh, uh, HIV and STBBI research within Canada are uh, leaders in this, in the area of discovery and innovation. Uh, and the focus in the areas for next five years for CIHR initiatives will be in accelerating discovery research to advance innovations for HIV AIDS and STBBIs for more equitable outcomes. And we will do this through, again, three different areas of focus, innovative technologies for testing and surveillance, uh, Interactions among infections and comorbidities. You know, we have seen a lot, even with COVID, uh, the involvement and comorbidities because of the overlap of the two uh, pandemics. Uh, and then next generation inter interventions, specifically in the supporting discovery research that contributes to design, development, and implementation of next generation interventions, including vaccine, multipurpose prevention technologies, 
long-acting injectable uh, antivirals, antibacterials, focused towards key populations uh, in need of more effective and tailored approaches across the cascade of care. Uh, and again, our next five-year vision is to advance next generation interventions for HIV and STDVI in key populations. Next slide. Uh, the, uh, the other two pillars, one is really about capacity building. So strengthening research capacity. Canada has recognized the world around the world as a leader in HIV and STBBI research. Uh, we did during the process of putting this strategic plan together, evaluation of the uh, work and impact of Canadian researchers, uh, which really competes very well, fifth in the world in terms of the impact in policymaking and in, in publications, but also in clinical practice. So I wanna applaud the community for the work that they have done but we have to maintain this leadership. So the third focus is really on the strengthening the research capacity. Uh, but again, by building uh, skills and supporting careers for next generation of our STBBI and HIV research community. So skills for the future, the training that really gets everyone, our, our next generation prepared for the 21st century problems in this area community-based research, which is a recognized strength uh, within the Canadian research community in this area, uh, career development, particularly focusing on mentorship, networking, and helping early and mid-career transitions for our researchers. We recognize that COVID-19 has had a devastating effect, especially on early career investigators and those that are transitioning to mid-career. So CIHR is very aware uh, and especially from the STBBI uh, and HIV strategic plan, uh, we are committed to providing uh, support for, uh, for these transitions for people, especially in the context of the last two and a half years and the effect that it has had. Uh, and then finally, the indigenous led research to continue to build and support a cadre of indigenous researchers uh, by providing training, funding, mentorship, uh, and other supports to enable long and productive careers. I want to flag here the burden that the current Indigenous researchers are carrying in terms of providing both uh, community engagement, uh, consultations to CIHR, but also supporting and mentoring their own next generation. So we are committed to helping um, Indigenous leaders and researchers today to be able to provide support to them to uh, help in these endeavors. We heard that quite a bit. And again, our five-year vision is to uh, build an inclusive and thriving research community. Next slide. Uh, and then the final pillar or the final strategic goal is the mobilizing knowledge. So mobilizing knowledge to enhance, share and foster equitable benefit of evidence-based interventions uh, with a particular focus on implementation science. Uh, again, uh, uh, nothing new to this community. Uh, they have been leaders in this area in terms of implementation science, uh, uptake and adoption of new and existing interventions. Uh, Community-centered research, uh, as I said, already a strength, but we need to continue to support that and continue to strengthen that. Uh, and then knowledge mobilization uh, capacity to uh, uh, encourage integration of communities uh, and community-based research and the voices of people with lived experience uh, in uh, research, but also decision makers and researchers to work together with a community and people with lived experience to co-create, synthesize, and share research findings. Uh, and the vision is, uh, five-year vision is that the needs of key populations are integrated across the cascade of care through this knowledge mobilization work. Next slide. Uh, and then finally, the five cross-cutting principles. Again, I won't get into the details of that, just to flag that the inclusive research excellence. Uh, I want to uh, point out that redefining research excellence is also a major goal for the CIHR's overall 10-year plan. So in alignment with that, uh, the STBBI and HIV Research uh, Initiative Strategic Plan is also 
uh, aligning with that to advance a more inclusive concept of research excellence that values not just the traditional academic input, but also multiple ways of knowing, collaboration, mentorship, community engagement, knowledge mobilization, and other contributions uh, that enhance research, which have traditionally not been recognized. Uh, engagement of people with lived and living experience, uh, something that's been pioneered by the HIV and STBBI community. Health equity, uh, you can see the, the concept of health equity resonates throughout this research plan. Uh, and is echoing again CIHR's overall strategic plans commitment, but also the Government of Canada's research initiative and Pan-Canadian Action Plan, which also has health equity as, as a big focus. The holistic concept of health, um, we heard this through a community, also indigenous uh, scholars and community-based organizations that we really need to have a cross-cutting theme of valuing the culture, belief, and knowledge system of both indigenous and Western concepts of health. Our research uh, approaches will therefore recognize multiple dimensions of health, including physical, emotional, social, spiritual, and the distinct uh, experiences, needs, and expectation of different communities and stages of life. Uh, and then finally, our commitment to truth and reconciliation, to commit to research and knowledge mobilization approaches that address the need of indigenous peoples uh, by prioritizing indigenous-led research, fostering self-determination, and in enabling distinct distinction-based approaches, which we heard a lot about that we need to really work with indigenous communities to allow them to take specific approaches that align with their community's needs. So uh, uh, I think the last couple of slides, next slide, Nadja. Uh, again, a big shout out and thank you for the engagement and commitment of your community representatives who sit on Shazrak. Uh, as uh, uh, Dr. Folk pointed out, they represent a, a variety of different pillars, lived experiences, community engagement, uh, and we are featuring here the, uh, all the Shazrak members that helped us in the last three years. Some of them have rotated out. So you see quite a panel here and new members that have joined us just this year. Um, uh, and also my colleagues from Public Health Agency of Canada uh, and uh, Dr. Tammy Clifford, who is the CIHR central leadership who uh, repre is represented on this uh, committee as well. So thank you all for staying with us, having the patience to work over the last three years to get to where we are. Hopefully we've landed in a good place despite the time that it took. Uh, and then the next slide, basically a big thank you to all the participants, the 300 participants in the engagement process, members of the uh, research community, uh, the STBBI community, trainees, indigenous scholars, health practitioners, partners, decision makers, and people with lived experience. Uh, especially grateful to the indigenous communities and organizations for their valuable contribution at, in very difficult time uh, over the past two years. Uh, and then a list of people, uh, our own uh, institute staff, uh, as well as our consultants who work with us on finalizing this uh, plan. Uh, and with that, uh, next slide. Right, so I wanted to take this opportunity while I have your attention to flag for you the upcoming AIDS 22 uh, conference, uh, which is in Montreal, as you know, CIHR. We have put together a really nice package of travel awards for trainees, uh, specifically directed at postdocs, students, residents, early career investigators, community-based research, and other individuals. Invite you to go to the CIHR website to find out more about this. Uh, we have more than 100 travel uh, awards that are available. Uh, so quite a few awards if you're looking to join face to face uh, or if you're joining virtually you have an option uh, just wanted to flag that this is available and the uh, uh, the deadline is coming up uh, you know uh, at the end of may so I invite you to explore this option if you're looking
here to support our community. So, uh, and I'd just like to bust the myth that anything that you write to CIHR falls into some dark black crevice. It doesn't. I can assure you that people monitor emails. I personally answer emails. That's, you know, the last two hours of my night, every night. So please reach out to us because we are here to support you, to hear your views and to work with you to make our research environment better and to support our researchers. Uh, thank you. Uh, so with that, I think we are running on mostly on time. So uh, Angela, I will hand this over to you. Uh, I want to introduce the discussion uh, on the health equity panel. Uh, and without taking too much time, just to basically say that this panel's to discussion topic resonates with the themes that you heard, uh, you know, in terms of the CIHR strategic plan. Uh, but also, um, uh, you know, as a biomedical researcher, I have really, uh, you know, had the benefit of having community engagement and working on an area of women's reproductive health that focuses on equitable outcomes. So uh, we'll come back to this later, but just to encourage everyone, regardless of what pillar or what area to work that you work in, to engage your key populations and to work with community and focus on equitable outcomes. Uh, and with that, I will hand it to Dr. Angela Kaida, who is uh, well known to this community. She's an associate professor in the Faculty of Health Sciences at Simon Fraser University a CRC chair in global perspectives of HIV and sexual and reproductive health, a national and international leader uh, in looking at the social structural factors and environment, uh, environments that increase vulnerability of uh, or protect sexual and reproductive health in the context of HIV. Uh, so Angela, over to you and thank you so much for um, being willing to moderate this panel. My pleasure, Charu. Thank you so much. And thanks so much for that overview of, I think, what's quite an exciting um, new direction for us or strategic direction for us as a community. So welcome, everybody. It's so great to see so many people on the line. As Charu said, I'm Angela Kaida. I'll be your moderator for this session. Um, and I am delighted and honored, as always, to join you from the unceded traditional ancestral territories of the Coast Salish people, including the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish First Nations. I'm joined today by three um, panelists, well-known researchers uh, for us across the country who do work in HIV and really center health equity. So first, I'd like to introduce Cian Wilson, Dr. Cian Wilson, who's an assistant professor at Wilfrid Laurier University, board chair of the AIDS Committee of Cambridge, Kitchener and Waterloo and area. And, you know, Sian has a, a very long history and experience working with black indigenous and other racialized communities in Canada and internationally around issues uh, pertaining to sexual and reproductive health, social determinants of health, HIV, and of course, overall well-being. Um, after Sian, I'm happy to introduce uh, Dr. Kate Shannon, who's a professor and CRC in gender equity, sexual health and global health at UBC where she leads efforts on gender equity and sexual health. Um, she's also the executive director of the Center for Gender and Sexual Health Equity at UBC and holds a CHR Sex and Gender Science Chair in Advancing Gender Transformational Sexual Health Care in Canada. Um, and then we have, we're delighted to welcome Dr. Alexandra King also to our panel today. Uh, many of you will be familiar with Alexandra, of course. But let me just say that she is an internal medicine specialist whose focus is HIV AIDS, hepatitis C, and their co-infections. And she is a citizen of the Nipsing First Nation in Ontario. Alexandra is the Cameco Chair of Indigenous Health and Wellness at the University of Saskatchewan. She's a PI and co-PI um, on numerous CHR project grants working with Indigenous communities and serves on many Indigenous health organizations and committees. So welcome to our three panelists today. And I'm gonna ask you um, a first question and I'll kind of, I'd love to start with you, Sian, and then Kate and then Alexandra. And it's really um, a question about health equity in this framework. Wondering, you know, from your perspective, your research, why is it important that we center health equity and equitable health outcomes um, in our HIV STBBI response? Can I, can I double barrel this question for you, Sian? Because the second part I want to double barrel is like, can you tell us a bit about the strategies, um, practices that you use and that you recommend could be really central to this response? 
Okay, perfect. Yeah, um, absolutely. And I'll uh, I'll try to try to separate those pieces, but they're they're also overlapping in in my answer. So I come from a social determinants of health framework in, in a lot of the community based work that I'm doing in black indigenous and racialized communities. I also incorporate black feminist thinking and analysis um, in my work um, as well. And uh, really, uh, you know, tried and true, a really great example of black feminist thought is intersectionality, which we use so, you know, frequently throughout a lot of different work across um, the health sector, um, increasingly now as we think about equity deserving communities. Um, and intersectionality is a concept that really comes out of black feminist thought. Um, and subsequent to that women of color um, thinking as well, who've further developed intersectionality to really focus on the ways in which communities are intersectionally marginalized. So even when we're talking about uh, black communities, they're also queer, there might be, they might be precariously housed, we might be dealing with issues of substance use, the ways in which all of these, these, um, you know, intersections of marginalization compound to impact the relationships and the realities of the communities that we're working with. And we can think about this in terms of, you know, people who are impacted by HIV as well in terms of the multiple layers of, of intersectional marginalization and oppression that they're facing and the different dynamics of that. Um, and so in addition to a social determinants of health framework, I also take from this, this sort of intersectional framework that comes out of black and, and, and women of color scholarship um, in sort of thinking and, and, and understanding um, better, uh, you know, how it is that health manifests differently in the different communities that I work with and, and, and really impacts their lives differently based on how they're intersectionally located. Subsequent to this, what's really important about an intersectional framing for understanding health is that if we cater and um, tailor our, whether it's interventions, our health um, approaches, our research projects, our um, health, uh, you know, healthcare interventions to the most intersectionally marginalized communities, we end up meeting the needs of most if not all communities, because the most intersectionally marginalized or multiply marginalized communities that we tailor to, we then meet the needs of folks who are less marginalized in some dimension or some dynamic. And that's sort of the, again, the black feminist thought and approach and ethic to doing this work um, is that if you cater to the most intersectionally marginalized, you end up meeting the needs ultimately of folks who are less marginalized um, as well. And you could take everyone along with you um, in, in sort of this health, uh, health-based health approach. And, and that's sort of just the way in which black, um, you know, ethic thinks about is thinking about the folks who are at the, at the bottom of that hierarchy and bringing everyone else along with us just because we're catering to the most marginalized. So that in an essence is, is why I think this work is, you know, it, you know, framing work from a health equity perspective, considering an intersectional framework, especially um, makes this, you know, uh, palatable, makes it feasible, makes it doable, um, you know, is, is why it's so important um, is that uh, we want to bring everyone along with us, not just the folks that are easy to access, the people that are in our doctor's offices, the people who have healthcare access, but what about all, about all of the reasons why folks can't access a doctor, for example, or can't how access healthcare, thinking about those intersections. Um, then your second part of your question asked about best practices. So in addition to an intersectional approach that benefits everyone and taking everyone along with us. So that's that's definitely a best practice kind of framing um, that, that I think is really pivotal to the work. I also view equity um, as not just a goal, um, that is an, an end goal of the, a research process, but in fact, a part of the process. Equity should be imbued throughout the process, how we interact and engage with our communities, our community partners as equal partners, how we, uh, you know, uh, engage with our, our student trainees, um, the ways in which we roll out a process. So thinking about equity throughout the process, not just as a goal of research. And then the last sort of best practice that I'll sort of lend here is thinking about research as an intervention. I think we're all so privileged to be able to do this work that we're so passionate about and spend time intellectualizing and pointificating about the theories and the different frameworks. This is a really, you know, privileged space to occupy and a perfect privileged profession to have. Um, and so for me, a part of that privilege comes with some responsibility. And for me, that responsibility is viewing research as an intervention um, into systemic oppression and systemic marginalization um, and viewing research as something that needs to push the needle constantly for the communities that we're working with, especially communities that are impacted uh, by HIV due to, again, intersectionally um, marginal, uh, marginalized and oppressive uh, sort of systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much. I don't know that anybody could fit as much thoughtful, uh, a lot, you know, sort of food for thought in, in such a short time. And thank you also for, I think, really bringing gratitude 
to black feminist like leadership and thought and scholarship to this equity conversation, just reminding of, of where you know this this thinking really comes from. So Kate, let me turn it over to you. Same question. Do, should I repeat it or are you good? I, I'm good, I think. Okay. <laughs> Thanks Great. so much, Angela. Okay. Um, so first of all, just um, I'm joining today and I'm grateful to be joining today from the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Suela Tooth Nations. Um, and I'm really pleased to be joining, having sat on the Chirac, I guess, previous iteration of Chirac uh, committees so of the CHR HIV AIDS committee from 2012 to 2017, as well as the Institute of Gender uh, and Health Advisory Board at the same time to see this really center conversation around health equity. Um, and I think first and foremost, what's been so well articulated already by uh, Sienna is that we know from decades of science, but particularly from community advocacy, from people living with um, and affected by HIV, um, that there is a disproportionate burden of not just SVBBIs, but um, access to along the cascade um, for what are so-called key populations, ranging from youth and young women, um, queer, trans, and other gender and sexual minority communities, um, indigenous, um, black, and other racialized immigrant communities, as well as criminalized populations. Um, and really inequity is driving SVBBI um, and disparities in response. And in order for us to move forward, we really need to ensure that health equity is centered uh, uh, not just in our response, but how we engage in um, research. And I love the idea of the research as intervention kind of framework. I think it's so important. Um, and I think where we're seeing critical advancements, not just in Canada, but globally in terms of whether it's biomedical or clinical or prevention science research, we also see that many of the same systemic um, inequities and systemic barriers that are placing certain communities at increased burden of HIV and access are also the same things that are driving or stalling our response into pandemics. So whether that's you know criminalization and policing, um, racism and transphobia and homophobia and stigma and discrimination. We know those are centered in why we're, you know, seeing advancements in some places and not, um, and really frame why we need to sort of take a health equity lens as we move forward. So I think building on what's been said so far, I think it's so critical that we are looking at it from an equity, equitable and inclusive, not just in our research agenda and how we engage. And I think there's lots to learn from um, and build on from decades of advocacy by HIV communities in terms of uh, JIPA and MIPA principles of how we meaningfully engage people who are living with and um, HIV or well as affected by HIV, um, and in this case more broadly to STBBIs. Um, and I just wanted to share when I first um, it was engaging in um, or asked it by community and specifically sex work organizations in the downtown east side over a decade ago um, to uh, come in and help look at what are the barriers or why our health access wasn't being accessed in terms of communities and to hear from communities. Um, there was such a huge stigma, which there still is, around HIV and STIs be, even being discussed. Um, and that really is centered on public health's own creation of that stigma and how sex workers have been framed for decades in terms of vectors of disease and public health, and really centered why we needed to come at this from a health equity lens and ensure that communities are at the forefront of defining what research agendas are needed, what are those gaps. Um, and this is everything from ensuring there's accurate representation in research um, and they're asking the right questions and interpreting the results to really redressing some of that harm that's been created, including by public health itself over many decades. Um, and I think not surprisingly, HIV wasn't even at the forefront or even anywhere near the top of priorities when we were talking with communities and sex work communities at the time of what are priorities when so many human rights issues weren't being addressed when sexual and reproductive health more broadly um, had huge gaps. Um, and really, in the end of the day, you know, uh, research uh, priorities and systemic barriers, whether that's um, policies or institutional barriers in terms of stigma and discrimination, um, provider discrimination, were really what were driving the priorities for sex work communities. Um, and what we saw, many, not just our research, but many others in Canada and globally, is that really, at the end of the day, addressing the pandemic within the context of advancing and affecting change for sex work communities, that criminalization and much more upstream systemic barriers and really intersecting oppressive pieces needed to be addressed if we were going to see um, change. And I was really fortunate to get to work with colleagues across Kenya and India and Canada as part of the Lancet series in 2014, focused on HIV and sex work. Um, and I think it was really, uh, it, it was an interesting to have such a diverse science and community people at the table. And it, in, in doing that, we were able to model what, a, what would structural change look like and how we could, if we're taking health equity lens, what would changes look like in advancing the HIV epidemic with sex workers. And much of the rich context to that modeling came from community itself. So our colleagues in Kenya and India and Canada sit, bringing forward what their evidence was and how that could be framed. And for, I can say for many of the modelers in the room in quantum basic science, it was the first time to really engage with community and see how that can really frame and 
advance science, not just in how we do it, but in terms of um, what we see in terms of outputs. So I guess just to end, I really want to say that I think the, the framing, I think as researchers, we do have such a privilege and responsibility that we need to not just be engaging ethically in terms and in, in and embracing a health equity lens in how we do the research. But I also think the huge piece, I was really pleased to see the knowledge mobilization piece. You know, I think we have a responsibility to make sure that we're advocating for and that change and that making sure that research is brought forward, whether that's to policymakers or, um, or, um, or practice um, and with and community really center that forefront of those um, discussions. So I'll end there to make sure there's time for the next speaker. Yeah, thank you so much, Kate. Um, and thank you, I think, for raising, you know, these structural forces that are, you know, that impede on equity goals, right, whether it's criminalization or stigma or violence. And so thanks for raising those as part of your comments as well. Alexandra, please let me come to you. I think um, I'll, I won't even ask the question. I think you know where you're going to go. Um, yes. Hi. Thanks. So, uh, first of all, I want to say, uh, really express my appreciation for being included in this panel uh, and this session. Really amazing people. I'm joining you today from the uh, territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, where I am a guest and ally. Um, so I, I think that there is so much in common uh, between how I'm looking at things as well as CN and Kate, and I thank them both for uh, their contributions. I'm hearing a lot about research as intervention, and we certainly uh, think that uh, research needs to be interventional, but we also look at this uh, from the perspective as research as transformation, research as activism, research as reconciliation, and um, really I, I think the other component is research as healing. Uh, so when we're looking at uh, the research through an equity lens, from an Indigenous perspective, I think this really involves um, centering on Indigenous ways of knowing, being, and doing, recognizing that there is huge diversity in the different ways that we come uh, to look at things, um, largely because we have so much diversity across this uh, incredible land uh, on which uh, we uh, have the privilege of uh, calling home. Um, we tend to look at things very much as context matters, and so San and others are using words like intersectional, and I certainly use that also, but I think context really uh, helps to um, put things uh, it, into priorities. And um, for us, we really look at it strength-based. So being Indigenous is not a deficit, but rather is something that should be protective and um, should uh, allow us uh, a ways forward in new and wonderful uh, transformational spaces. Uh, we tend to be very holistic in how we approach things. Self-determination is absolutely critical, and this is of the individual, their family, um, community, and uh, nation. Um, and uh, we tend to then have um, different conceptualizations, not only of ourselves, health and well-being, but also of gender and the importance of gender, not only um, to the individual, but again, to the health and overall wellness of the community. Um, we uh, are uh, looking at uh, directly addressing colonization through research, and in particular, reconciliation provides us with those tools. And I see reconciliation as uh, being put possible in all aspects of research and all pillars of research. And so uh, the, the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Calls to Action certainly provide guidance as to um, how we can operationalize this. And um, a lot of this then is doing research with Indigenous people, um, having our research done by them and supporting them in their visions forward as to what um, transformation uh, uh, needs to happen. Um, when I was looking at the uh, in cross-cutting uh, principles, I, I was very excited because I feel that CIHR has been on a journey and where it is heading next is very exciting uh, spaces for us all and really challenges us all to dig deep and uh, look at how we can be transforming society through research and um, the uh, cross-cutting uh, principles also uh, touch upon such uh, critical aspects of uh, data sovereignty and uh, how we are using uh, or could be using data to really help achieve health equity. Um, I believe that I was also asked to talk a little bit about um, clinical uh, research because 
I, I am um, a clinician and am involved in some clinical research. Uh, I'm not a trialist or uh, by any means, but um, I'm involved in a couple of projects uh, such as uh, the can -Hep -C virtual cascade of care um, uh, study, which is really an innovative approach to uh, a cohort study in that we are doing it virtually and um, really considering how and when people who use drugs are engaging with the healthcare system, uh, as well as then when the healthcare system is failing people who use drugs and uh, helping to articulate then perhaps alternative uh, care pathways. Um, my focus, of course, is the intersection with Indigenous people, but also we uh, have brought in a strong rural versus urban focus because we know that for people who use drugs, uh, depending on where they live matters. Um, there are other studies that uh, I'm involved with that are looking at shared models of care, such as the drum and sash uh, study. And one of the things that I find so exciting about this is that it's really taking a distinctions-based approach to individual First Nations and the models of care that they require, but also in this project, working with Métis Nation Alberta, uh, we have uh, been successful in developing a Métis-specific approach to uh, this. So we're not taking an Indigenous approach and transforming it. We're not taking a mainstream approach and transforming it, but rather we're looking at specifically Métis ways of knowing, being, and doing, and what that brings into the equation. So again, very much strength-based. Uh, and um, uh, I think that uh, working with um, Indigenous approaches allows us to really build upon that for others as well. Thank you so much, Alexandra. I I just think, you know, when you bring in the strength-based approaches, research, research as reconciliation, I what I hear so much in your comments is a real calling in, right? A real invitation to our entire, you know, HIV, STBBI research community um, around engaging in this learning and, and this work. So I want to thank you. I think that was a perfect way. Um, I will, you know, I know that we're short on time, but if I can receive a if I can ask you, okay, so I'm getting some instruction that we do, for those who can stay, I'm getting an instruction that we can go a little bit over. We do have a few questions in the chat. Um, and maybe I will pose this first question. Um, it's, it's about technologies. And actually, I wonder, Charu, if this is a question for you. Um, and I'll invite these panelists to also respond. But the question says, can you expand on the technologies that may be used and how they may be perceived as policing medication um, adherence? So this comes from the presentation on where we were going to focus on prevention, I think. How do you think these are going to be perceived or used by newly diagnosed people with HIV? And how exactly will these technologies be used? So I think that, you know, the person, this, this um, community member is asking, is, is concerned about the ways in which new technologies may be abused. Yeah, so I think it's a really uh, thoughtful question. Uh, you know, we know that in uh, other spaces, for example, in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and other uh, locations, you know, the technology of sending reminders for medication or book visits, et cetera, has been used very successfully actually to keep people in within cascade of care. Uh, but the question really is, uh, you know, the, uh, the um, consent from people who want to participate or not participate and not push the technology as is being pointed out as a monitoring or policing device. Right, so there are lots of people who would like to or benefit from this. So that's the two-edged sword of the technology. Are you monitoring or following people without their knowledge and consent, or are you doing it in an ethical manner with their consent, you know, to help them or assist them in ways that they would like to be helped or assisted? So to me, you know, that's the fine line for technology and where it should be used. But really for uh, us as a funding agency, it's the ethical principles, uh, you know, that would have to be meet the bar for when people propose send their proposals for technologies. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so just want to reassure people that from CIHR's perspective, uh, you know, we have a very high bar. Uh, and of course, every institute that funds research has their own ethics research boards that view or review these principles very carefully. Okay, 
Um, Angela, sorry, can I just leap yeah. in? Uh, yes, of course. I, I think the cross-cutting principle of engagement uh, with people with lived experience may really help here in that they can help guide the research how it is approached and the process that would be used with new technologies so that they can really potentiate people's ability to manage their health and wellness rather than something that could be um, rolled out as a monitoring. You know what I mean? So I, I think that, again, there is so much within the new strategic plan that uh, could potentiate really solid, ethical, equity promoting research. And that's uh, where we have to be focusing. Thank, thank you, Alexandra. Thank you, Charu, for that response as well. So let me um, ask the second question. And uh, Sian, I'm gonna start with you on this question because I think um, it's really relevant. So the question says, how do the panelists envision a holistic perspective of sexual and reproductive health being taken up in this new strategic plan? So how do we move beyond what's often like a physical slash biomedical paradigm of HIV, ST, BBI research? Yeah, and I think, you know, in response to this, I'm going to build up on, on Dr. King's, you know, comments earlier, uh, which is viewing health as not just about our genitalia, not just about our medication to the, the question before, but our whole holistic selves, our entire personhood, our sovereignty, which I think the, the previous question was also asking about, um, which is that, you know, if we don't want to participate in these things, how do we resist that? And how is CIHR going to support the resistance uh, to surveillance and, 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 and unethical kinds of research? right is ultimately what I read the previous question is as sort of asking the question about so for me um, it's viewing um, communities as holistic individuals right spiritual health physical health mental health the whole bit um, it's not just to view individuals in terms of you know one part or facet of themselves um, is to view communities and individuals as as holistic individuals and only then really can any any sort of research approach or intervention or transformational approach be effective as if we actually view individuals as holistic beings um, and not just in a one-dimensional frame uh, I think that that's super important for for our health approaches is to, to view communities holistically the other part of, of that question that I'll sort of also speak to is that it's not sufficient to just do research for research sake so back to the earlier points that we were all making, the research has to be intervention, it has to be transformational, it has to be advocacy, it has to be reconciliation. Research for research's sake, just to observe communities that are marginalized, we're past that. That's a colonial frame of doing work is just to observe communities while they die. Intervention is to actually do something about that, to actually, you know, advocate around systemic change, to advocate um, and push the research um, to actually do this work of, of transforming the, the circumstances, the material conditions that leave communities in, in you know, in the sort of, uh, you know, multiply marginalized uh, positions that they often are left as a result of systemic violence. Um, and so these are some of the ways that I think about, uh, you know, the, the, that that sort of framing of, of research as, as, you know, pushing the needle and transformation and reconciliation and intervention that we were speaking about before, um, as well as thinking about this holistically, that it's not just about the individual, it's not just about the body, it's physical, it's spiritual, it's systemic, it's all of these things. So looking at an ecological model, if you will, or, uh, you know, a, a larger, more holistic model to health. Thank you so much, Sian. Um, I think you've just like really invoked probably for a lot of people some like big thinking, some almost emotional reaction to some of the words that you've shared with us today. So I thank you for that. Kate, let me turn to you if to see if, is there something that you would add to, to that question or something else that you wanted to reflect on as we move towards closing today's panel? Sure. I'll be really brief because I think Sian did a much uh, really powerful explanation of I, I think I think I would just say that you know hearing sexual and reproductive health I think also allows us to really um, reframe or embrace a, a, a different approach and I think that moving away from that sort of really risk deficit model that um, we we are we are past in many ways but HIV and STIs. I think framing it in a broader context allows us to look at it, you know, from a human rights perspective, from a sex positive perspective, from LGBTQ affirming perspective, from, you know, looking at indigenous cultural safety and, um, and reconciliation. So I think really making sure that we're embracing a much more broader approach, um, I think is critical and is, is absolutely the way forward. And I think within the broader kind of HIV that is now STBIs, I think it is so critical that we, we move past that kind of risk deficit based models that, um, and to really embracing that broader kind of rights-based and sexual reproductive health framing. Thanks so much, Kate. Alexandra, Dr. King, can I ask you to close our moderated panel today with any final reflections you have? Um, 
Well, I was going to say, I, I just have so much respect for my co-panelists and uh, Angela, of course, for you. And um, I, I think one of the things, as Hannah mentioned about uh, spiritual aspects, and I, that is incredibly important. There's also cultural aspects. And so one of the things that we're seeing within the Indigenous community is a uh, reawakening of our ways of knowing, being, and doing. And that includes such things as rites of passage. And so from a sexual and reproductive health perspective, then these are very protective approaches and um, not pathology based, but rather strengths based again and uh, looking at uh, us uh, coming together as a collective uh, in uh, each of us enjoying individual wellness. So I think that um, there are so many ways that we could be uh, really learning from Indigenous uh, approaches and it benefiting more than um, just us. But. Oh, thank you so much. What a great way to end this panel. And I think if I can share two quick things that I've really heard here is a calling in um, from our panelists around the questions of equity, that there is much space for scientific ex excellence and exploration and creativity and really transformative work ahead of us by centering equity in this plan. I've also really heard of us, of you talking about equity as a verb. It's not a place. It's not a noun. It's, it's a verb. And so the process of doing work that centers equity is itself transformative. Um, I also think we have, and when I say calling in, I mean across the health pillars, health sciences research pillars. So maybe this is the space for those of you in biomedical research or clinical sciences research, pop health, epi, all the way, you know, social sciences, et cetera, uh, health services research, like this is a calling in for all of us. So I really wanna just thank our panelists today and thank CIHR for inviting us um, to sort of speak to this, this plan um, and it's the hope and optimism I, I think that it presents. Charu, I'll, I'll hand it over for, to you for the final words. Thank you so much, Angela, and uh, uh, very, very grateful to this panel to set the context of what we wanted to bring across and what we've heard so much in the last two years and the flavor, you know, and the strength of this plan, which has a very big focus on equity. Uh, and in all humbleness, this is a start of a conversation. It's not the end or the final conversation that we will have. Uh, so it's a new way for us to work. We will continue to engage people, you know, again, inviting people to reach out to us if you have thoughts on what you're seeing or hearing. Uh, the staff have just told me that the plan is now live on the CIHR website. And if you open your inboxes and you have signed on to CI uh, um mail, then it should have landed in your, the, connect, the uh, website connection should have landed in your inbox. Uh, so thank you so much. Hopefully uh, you will spend a little bit time today or whenever you have time and uh, see yourself and your work reflected in that. Uh, please reach out to us. We are here to listen and we are here to work with our community. Uh, you know, so we're not just funders. We want to shape and uh, shape the research uh, in this in Canada and around the world to help improve the health of Canadians and globally. Uh, you know, and especially for people who are marginalized and people who are vulnerable. Uh, so this whole plan really speaks to that. Uh, and I thank you for your engagement. I am so impressed that more than 100 people are still online uh, listening to this five or seven minutes after the time. So thank you. And I hope you will enjoy your lunch and enjoy the rest of the conference. And again, a big thank you to the panelists today. <laughs>